I promise you he is. And we can walk the edge of the sword a little bit. And I think that as something we discussed yesterday, that tension that might be there a little bit is kind of where God is in, in many cases. So, all right, our next presenter, uh, he has been the managing director of an ad agency. He is an actor, was an actor, still an actor, I'm not sure, but he's got many credits on commercials. He was in Dumb and Dumber, and he's credited on it, right? When I learned this, my esteem for Brad just went way up here. Very impressive. And, and it makes sense because he's pretty funny. So, ladies and gentlemen, Brad Louder. Huh? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm going to unmute my computer that, yeah, those are all emails coming in, those ding. Either that or pure inspiration. Um, all right. Uh, first of all, I'm going to take a, a page from Elaine Dalton's playbook and give you a surprise musical number that not even the singers are aware of. In just a moment, when I give you the cue, I'm going to have Nathan Pacheco, Conlon Bonner come up and we're going to, to uh, do a musical number, number from the three tenors. You guys remember the three tenors? So Nathan will be uh, Luciano Pavarotti. Uh, Conlon's going to be Jose Carreras. And I'll be Placebo Domingo. <laughs> Placebo because I'm not a real singer. No, you can actually stay seated. That was, was all the work up to the placebo gag, which I, I appreciate you laughing. Um, <laughs> So in the, in the time I've got today, the subject matter I'd like to talk about is seeing others through the lens of pure love. And one way to truly give ourselves and others spiritual momentum is to see us and others as God sees us, to look for the good in others, to be quick to forgive and slow to judge. But before we get into the meaty stuff, we're going to start with the fun stuff. Here's uh, Marjorie and, and I. We've been married, it'll be 11 months this May, 11 years, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, we uh, were both previously divorced. We were introduced by a mutual friend and dated long distance. I was living in Northern California. She was in Salt Lake City. We had a long distance uh, experience dating and... Uh, we fell in love. I, I like, you know, when I speak, I feel the earth move. Do you feel it too? <laughs> that's, just, that's just the energy I channel when I speak. Um, <laughs> they're apparently firing up the, the engines. Um, I like to say that when Marjorie and I first met, our very first de date, I was smitten, and she was mildly curious. Um, <laughs> But I'm so grateful to her, uh, and what a beautiful relationship we have. She's my sweetheart, my best friend, my biggest cheerleader, and I, I'm just grateful beyond words <clears throat> to her. So let me switch back to some cuter, funnier stuff. This is my parents, Dee and Pat Louder. Uh, 1967, when I was 10 years of age, we relocated from Salt Lake City to Santa Rosa, California, and um, had a wonderful experience growing up there. My father has a legendary, legendary sense of humor. Um, this is a picture. Anyone want to guess what year this was taken based on the glasses and my mother's Jackie O haircut? What year? 1959. No, come on, not even close. Think Jackie O. 66, give that man a cheroot. That's correct. And that handsome lad in the horn rim glasses and the bolo tie is me. And, you know, like all good uh, things, it's come back around, and that's how I go to church these days. So, um, but anyway, my dad, living in California with, with seven kids, always got the question, D, seven kids? How in the heck? What, what happened? How? Explain that to me. He goes, ah, I blame it on my, my wife's poor hearing. I go, what? He said, let me explain it to you. Every night, I would climb into bed, and I'd say, so, Pat, do you want to go to sleep or what? And she'd say, what? <laughs> Seven kids later. Uh, and, yeah, that's one I can't tell in sacrament meetings, so I'm grateful to, 
have a place to share that. I didn't make that up. That's, that's a true story. Uh, part of my, my dad's legendary sense of humor, uh, he served you know, in a bishopric. He was, wait, do you guys remember back when we had Sunday school early in the morning? You'd have opening exercise, and then you'd come back later. Well, he was the, the Sunday school president for years. So he would get up and conduct the opening exercises. And it was, I would like to just look around the congregation to gauge people's, I mean, they were sitting on the edge of their seats, like, what is D going to say? What is he going to do? And I remember one particular Sunday, he announced, the opening song is hymn number 212, uh, Air You Left the Room This Morning, or in my case, with a house full of teenagers, did you air the room you left this morning? <laughs> True story. That was my dad. Um, anyway, this is a picture of, of my kids and grandkids. They're not all there, but mostly at a family reunion a couple years ago, uh, playing a game that always devolves into making things, uh, props and costumes out of foil. Um, and then last summer, this is a picture of, of me at my daughter's house in Scottsdale, Arizona, when we went out to attend two children's baptisms. Um, and this is a picture of Marjorie's family at her, uh, <laughs> at her annual uh, family reunion in Midway. Uh, this was, uh, I think it was last, last July. Um, there were many, many who were out of town and couldn't make it, so, but even so, one of the grandsons brings his drone, because that's the only way we can get a picture with the whole family. So if you look in the middle, you can see her dad and Wendy uh, seated. Anyway, just such a lovely family, and it's, it's an amazing <clears throat> experience to, uh, to be adopted into this family. You know, when we were dating and getting serious and considering marriage, I thought, oh, man, well, how many years is it going to take me before they're gonna like me and accept me. And it was, I mean, immediate. They are so loving and so kind and so good. And just immediately took me in as one of their own. Um, then another picture of, of us visiting my youngest son and his wife um, a few months ago when they had their first baby out in Houston. Uh, Marjorie and I are kind of adventurous. One of our favorite pastimes is traveling around on our motorcycle. So we've seen a lot of the Western United States, sometimes with ourselves and just, and then sometimes with, a, with our motorcycle gang. Um, it's like a bunch of old, you know, people who've been state presidents, mission presidents, so we're not real tough. Um, anyway, this was uh, before the pandemic. With this group of, of uh, motorcycle friends, we went to Europe and rented motorcycles and spent a week touring through the Swiss Alps on motorbikes. And this is at the base of, um, of uh, what's it called, Sermat, uh, Matterhorn, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, it was one of those rides in Disneyland. Anyway, it's just wonderful. And part of, part of our adventurous nature is we just finished building a home. We have a little farm in Heber, and the two of us built a home. We didn't do everything, but we did a lot of the work. Here she is on top of a ladder. Uh, actually installing trim around a window way up in the air. And um, guys, am I right? Like, is there anything sexier than your wife? You know, operating power tools and <laughs> air guns is pretty, pretty dang hot. It's like, can I say the word hot on momentum? Anyway, Marjorie is incredibly talented, not afraid to tackle anything. She tiled a bunch of the bathroom floor. She'd never laid tile before. Um, anyway, just, just a true inspiration. Uh, <clears throat> in the introduction, it was mentioned I had a small part in Dumb and Dahmer, or as I like to call it, the greatest movie ever made. <laughs> so here's the snippet. Uh, sorry for the poor quality. I did edit out a piece that maybe isn't entirely appropriate, appropriate even though, you know, we're on a cruise ship. Anyway, it goes something like this. So he says, do you love me? And she says, no, but that's a real nice ski mask. <laughs> Don't worry, 
I edited this part out. <laughs> anyway, that's me next to Jim Carrey on the, on the couch. <laughs> so my kids were... Yeah, thank you. No, really. No, really, thank you. <laughs> Anyway, it was such a riot, and, and uh, I got so much mileage out of this with my kids in junior high and high school at the time. They, you know, all their friends thought I was the coolest dad ever. Um, I also got to do a commercial with Sharon Stone. Uh, it was for an Italian bank. We shot it in San Francisco. I played the part of an NBA coach. <clears throat> anyway, really, really fun, and she was absolutely delightful and charming to work with. Um, <clears throat> I've done a ton of commercials. Um, some, you know, made-for-TV movies, episodic TV. This was an episode of America's Most Wanted where I, I don't have the clip, unfortunately, where I was murdered. So I got to be murdered on national TV. Uh, the coolest part is it was this big fight scene um, where I was like a, a, sh a cook at a uh, kind of a sports bar. It's closing up at night, and there's a bandit who had hidden in the cellar, wanting to, to break into the safe. I happened upon him. Fight ensues. So we had this choreographed fight scene. We're just beating each other up. At one point, I grab an empty wine bottle, break it over his head, and then I'm trying to get away, and I'm going up the steps out of the cellar, and he shoots me twice on the stairs. I fall down and do this incredibly cool stunt fall down the stairs. And the answer is yes, just like Tom Cruise, I do my own stunts. <laughs> so, um, any of you who have a uh, go and do t-shirt, I'd be happy to autograph it for you later. Uh, <laughs> my kids, when we moved near, uh, back to, I, I moved my family back to um, near Santa Rosa in the Sonoma Valley bought a little farm there, <clears throat> raised our family there, north of San Francisco. So we got a, a talent agent there who loved us, loved that we were a real family. And uh, the kids got into the business, and they uh, did quite a bit of work. And you can see why. These are my daughters uh, playing for the local soccer team. They're just adorable. Um, it's my youngest son, Dallin, with the, just kind of goofing off with my mom. Um, when he was kind of 10 to 12 years of age, he had this blonde, blonde, super curly, big mop of hair, and that charming smile looked like a little surfer dude. And so he, uh, everything he auditioned for, he got. Uh, he was the, on the homepage of Gap Kids website for you know, several months. Did a ton of, of uh, print work for <clears throat> Gap and Eddie Bauer and all these companies. So anyway, they loved it. They had a blast doing it. They booked a bunch of commercials, and, and um, it was a real fun thing for them. It helped fund their, their college education. Um, but the thing that I'm really, really, really famous for, well, <clears throat> are my Brad jokes. And I invite any and all of you to follow me on Facebook. I don't post every day, especially when I'm on a cruise, but I try and most days, um, you know, if you take bad joke and dad joke and combine them, it's a Brad joke. So that's what I do, is I post these, these very, very, very funny jokes uh, on Facebook. Here's one of my recent ones. I'll wait. I'll read this one for you. I ate a synonym roll for breakfast. It gave me the th thesaurus throat ever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I love, you You are still laughing. Thank you. Um, and then this is, this is another one I like. <laughs> okay, those of you who aren't laughing, ask your buddy next to you who is laughing, and they'll explain it to you. All right, enough of, enough of that. Um, we're we're going to get a little bit serious here for a minute. Um, I know that's, with that setup, that's hard to believe, but, but um, I'm going to share some things that I've learned from others <clears throat> that I'm still learning myself. I'm going to share some personal and uh, experiences where I'm going to be a little bit vulnerable, and, um, but I want to set the stage for this. 
President Nelson said, resolve to be kind to others. When the Savior Jesus Christ visited the Americas, as recorded in the Book of Mormon, one of the first things he taught was the need to eliminate contention in our lives. So please be compassionate, be understanding, be slow to judge, and quick to forgive. I love this quote. Sorry, it's a little bit long, but Elder Karen, I mean, how much, how much do we love Elder Karen? He's amazing. I love his description of Marjorie's dad. He said, a remarkable character trait I've observed in President Nelson since I first met him is his practice of seeing the best in people. He chooses to focus on the person's higher qualities. I've personally been the beneficiary of President Nelson's choice to approach life this way, as I have felt that he sees me better than I am and does not focus on my weaknesses and shortcomings. With love and patience, he has encouraged me in my growth and development. I believe this is how our Heavenly Father sees us, his precious children. This is a highly valuable attribute in a leader because the effect on me has been that I have wanted to live up to this view of me, to be better and become better as a result. So that's what we're going to talk about for a couple minutes. <clears throat> uh, I shared a little about my legendary, my dad's legendary sense of humor. His greatest quality was his capacity for unconditional love. <clears throat> um, when he passed away, uh, he had been serving in the bishopric and their ward in Santa Rosa. And at the viewing, person after person came through the line and said kind of the same thing. I loved your dad so much. He loved me unconditionally. He saw the best in me. He brought out the best in me. And many of them said, now, don't tell anyone else I said this, but I think I was his favorite in the ward. <laughs> what a great talent. C.S. Lewis taught that the Christian should not think God will love us because we are good, but that God will make us good because he loves us. Uh, this is actually a, a photograph of me before I spent an hour and a half in hair and makeup. Uh, before, no. <clears throat> it's actually Johann Wolfgang von Goethe who taught a great principle. He said, if you teach some, you treat someone as they are, they will stay that way. You treat someone as they can become, then they will become it. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, where are you? I had some more inspiration for you. And if you don't believe me, there it is. Um, I want to give you a quick story where I had a front row seat to, to this. Living in Santa Rosa, where I raised my, my family, and um, I was a ward mission leader. And this lovely couple in our ward, Dave and Karen Etten. She was a member of the church, he wasn't. He attended every week, was all the activities. Lovely, lovely person. And the poor missionaries, you know, every set that would come in, Brother Louder, what's the deal with Dave Etten? Why isn't he baptized? What do we do? We've he's been taught all the lessons 40 times and won't accept the baptismal invitation. So I thought about it and I prayed about it. And the thought occurred to me, we're approaching it from the idea that Dave needs us. Dave needs the gospel. We're here to fix him. He needs all of our goodness. And Heavenly Father helped me see it a little differently and see that, no, we need Dave. So I went to the bishop and I said, Bishop, I've been praying about Dave and here's what, here's the deal. <clears throat> I want to call him as a ward missionary. I want him serving by my side. He's got an outgoing personality. He's just sweet and wonderful. Everybody loves him. He'd be a fabulous word missionary. The bishop goes, whoa, 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 whoa. he's not even a member. I said, yeah, I know. I know. We, we need to take care of that. <laughs> I said, will you call him in and issue the call? 
And when he says, wait, 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 you say, well, yeah, well, we need to take care of that detail. But tell him how much I want him to be one of my ward missionaries because I love him. And the guy just exudes love. So the bishop said, uh, uh, um, I'll call him in, but will you come in too? Because I don't know if I, I'm comfortable saying that. So I am. So the three of us met, told Dave the same thing. So Dave, I feel strongly Heavenly Father wants you to be a ward missionary in a ward. Would you accept the calling? He got a little teary-eyed and he said, um, wouldn't, don't, don't, like, you have to be a member to do that? Yeah. He said, can I have three days to think about it? This was on a Sunday evening. Can I call you guys back Wednesday? Sure. Give it some thought. Pray about it. Talk to Karen about it. Take it to the Lord. See if, if, if he's cool with this or if it's just Brad coming up with a weird idea. So he had three days to think about it. Monday night, 24 hours later, he called the bishop. And he said, I picked a date for my baptism. And my, I had to pick a date. Sorry, it took me 24 hours, but my son, who was a member of the church, is going to fly out to baptize me, and I had to arrange around his schedule. <clears throat> this is my brother, Dan. He's, I was the sixth, am the sixth of seven children. He's the next older brother, five years older than I. So we were very close growing up, shared a bed together when I was little. He'd read to me every night. He had this big, thick book of poetry. He would read me poems. He would read to me out of the world book encyclopedia before I could even read. And uh, he was my hero and maybe my best friend as a child. Well, Dan, as an adult, battled alcohol addiction his entire adult life. And uh, probably his longest period of sobriety was a year been in and out of rehab several times, attended AA meetings regularly, um, and tragically at age 32, he passed away from uh, an accident related to his, his alcoholism. But one thing they s told me that really stuck with me, when he was telling me about the importance of AA in helping him battle this illness. I said, Brad, did you realize in AA there's a 24-hour chip that if you show up at a meeting and say, I've been sober for 24 hours, they stand up and cheer and they give you a chip that you can stick in your pocket honoring that accomplishment. <clears throat> well, this is not a quote from Dan, but from someone else that I love. Someone who also is in recovery. He says, when I'm late to church, people turn around and stare at me with frowns of disapproval. I get the clear message that I'm not as responsible as they are. When I'm late to AA, the meeting comes to a halt And everyone jumps up to hug me and welcome me. They realize that my lateness may be a sign that I almost didn't make it. Now, we have these really cool signs on our church that say, Visitors, welcome. Will you join with me to make that a reality? Because let me tell you something. I know this for a fact. People who are considering looking into our faith as part of their faith journey as a consideration or people who have stepped away from the church and are feeling this urge, this nod, this, this feeling to come back, can you imagine how hard it is for them to walk through the doors? We have an opportunity to create a culture of 
100% acceptance and love. This is what people considering coming through the doors aren't saying, I wonder what their doctrine is. I wonder, wonder how they interpret this scripture. They're asking three questions. How is this going to feel? Will I be accepted? And will I feel like I belong? My buddy, Kurt Frankham, another wonderful LDS podcaster, has a podcast called Leading Saints. And my second favorite podcast he's ever done <clears throat> was an interview he did with Kurt Brown, who was called to be the bishop of a mid-single adult ward in Utah County. And it was a brand new ward. No one knew about it. So he went in. Well, first of all, let me tell you, when he was called, Blake Roney issued the call. And he said, Kurt, remember, you're not the gatekeeper. You're the welcoming committee. Well, he set about to create a culture of 100% acceptance in this ward. And they saw miraculous things happen. Every Sunday, he or a counselor, when they got up to welcome the congregation, said, whatever your background is, if you woke up this morning with a desire to do good and be closer to the Savior, you're in. So these were the kind of the foundations of this culture of 100% acceptance that they set about to create. First of all, that the idea that wherever you are, the Savior's arm reaches you. They said, we wanted to create this 24-hour chip culture. And we need to counter this narrative of the adversary, that he convinces us we're broken, that we're on the outside looking in. And then finally, when someone stands up and says, I'm weak, I'm struggling, we need to celebrate because that is the beginning of the healing. I said it was my second favorite podcast. My first favorite podcast is my sweet, sweetheart Marjorie. An interview he did with Kurt talking about her lovely mother, Dancel White Nelson. So sometime when you've got 40 minutes and you're, you got, you know, hey, what podcast should I listen to? Try this one. Um, it's a beautiful tribute to her mother, and you'll, you'll learn more about Dancel and really grow to love and, and respect her. <clears throat> Elder Gary Saban said, we will never regret being too kind. In God's eyes, kindness is synonymous with greatness. Part of being kind is being forgiving and non-judgmental. My mission president in the Germany Music Munich mission, some, I don't know, many years ago, was Elder F. Encio Busha, who's German, brilliant man, so filled with the spirit. <clears throat> Looking back, I realize now that most of the time he was teaching us, sisters and elders, and training us, it wasn't about how to be a good missionary, how to baptize more people. It was how to be good human beings, how to be good spouses, how to be good parents. I'm so grateful. One of the important things he taught us that I've never forgotten is this simple idea. When someone is doing things that aren't right and you know they're messing up, our immediate response is to correct them or point it out. He said that's the absolute worst thing we can do. They already know what they're doing wrong. The Holy Ghost is already whispering to them, you're messing up, this is wrong. So when we point it out to them, they rebel, they push back. So the right answer is, when we see what they're doing wrong, we point out their good qualities. We call out their beauty and their, their righteousness and their goodness where we can find it. And then the light of Christ or the Spirit burns brighter in them, and that becomes the motivation for them to change and do better. Um, Okay. Will you guys help me do a social experiment? Are you up for it? Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you some questions. And if you can answer in the affirmative, I want you to raise your hand. Now, 
Here's where it gets interesting. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Do you trust me? All right, everyone, close your eyes. If you or someone you love dearly is experiencing same-sex attraction or gender dysphoria, raise your hand. If you or someone you love dearly is experiencing a faith crisis or has even left the church, raise your hand. Keep your hand up. Don't take it down every time. Leave it up. Third question. Anyone you know in your family or close circle of friends who's experiencing addiction, raise your hand. Keep your hands up. Anyone near and dear to you experiencing mental health challenges, raise your hand and keep it up. Keep your hands up. Anyone you love has been a victim of abuse, emotional, physical, sexual abuse. If you've experienced any of these, keep your hand up. And finally, anyone you love attempted or completed suicide, raise your hand. Now, keep your hand up. Don't, don't put it down. If any of you could answer yes to all of these, raise both your hands. Now open your eyes. Leave your hands up. Open your eyes. And I want you to look around the room. Thank you. Here's the good news. You're not alone. You just saw it. You just experienced it. You just felt it. It's easy for us to get caught in this idea, this misconception that we're unique, that we're experiencing stuff, hard stuff, that we're wrestling with and no one else is. And Marjorie and I get caught up in this because, you know, we're... <laughs> We're two-handers on this one. And there are days where we feel a little bit like Tevye and Fiddler on the Roof when he said, Dear God, I know we're the chosen people, but once in a while, couldn't you pick on somebody else? Remember when he said that? <laughs> That's us, <laughs> fairly regularly. And then we remind ourselves, no, we're not special. We're not, you know, it's Everybody. We're all experiencing this with the people that we love most. So I want to talk a little bit about maybe some tools and some perspective that can help us navigate these situations. The first thing I want to share with you is, is the core of Marjorie's and my mission statement as a couple. And it's this idea that we show up for our people. Um, having served in a YSA ward a few years back, many of them get married and invite us to their ceiling or their reception. We live in Heber. Sometimes it's an hour, hour and a half drive, tired from work, <clears throat> all these reasons why, yeah, I don't know if we're going to make it. And one or the other of us says to the other, we show up for our people. And we quit being babies and we go, put on our nice clothes and make the drive. Sometimes that looks like going to a queer wedding. When five years ago, would never imagine that would be part of our experience. For us, it could look like, does look like, going to Arizona to attend a baptism into the Greek Orthodox Church, something not too many years ago. We couldn't even imagine that would be part of our experience. But when the invitations come, do we say, we can't do that. We can't look like we're supporting this kind of behavior. We can't send the message that we support this or we're okay with it. No. We look at each other and we say, we show up for our people. And we don't do it begrudgingly. We don't sit in the back. 
we're there on the front row cheering them on and celebrating the important moments of their life because we love them. Marjorie has a corollary to that, and she says, we'll marinate them in our love, and she knows how to do it. And whether it's, you know, when we first got married, one of my four children, <clears throat> kind of wrestling with the concept of, oh, if I love Marjorie, does that mean I love my mother less? You know, all of the things that we do, all the mental gymnastics we do when we're navigating new stuff. And I apologized to Marjorie one day. I said, I'm sorry that this child of mine isn't being as loving and as kind as I know she's capable of. And she said, no, don't worry about it. I'll just marinate her in my love. And she did, and she continues to. And it didn't take long before this child of mine was completely in love with Marjorie, saw all of her goodness. And um, anyway, I just, I just love that. And, and she says it frequently. You know, if there's someone that maybe doesn't like us very much, um, it's okay. We'll just marinate them in our love. <laughs> and it works. These are some powerful, powerful words from Sister Runya from last conference that... When she spoke him, I was just like, oh, my goodness, yes, yes, yes. Here's what she said. And this is right back to the core of what we're talking about. Our job is not to teach someone who's going through a rough patch that they are bad or disappointing. On rare occasions, we may feel prompted to correct, but most often, let's tell our loved ones in spoken and unspoken ways the messages they long to hear. Our family feels whole and complete because you are in it. You will be loved for the rest of your life, no matter what. Ask yourselves, I'm not going to make you raise your hand again. Is there someone in your family, a child, a grandchild, an in-law, someone really close to you that needs to hear those words? Sister Runya said, they, they long to hear these words spoken and unspoken. There is power in speaking these words out loud. And she goes on to say, sometimes what we need is empathy more than advice listening more than a lecture. Listening is an act of love, isn't it? So one of, uh, Dave Isay, the founder of StoryCorps that's on NPR, uh, written dozens of New York Times bestsellers. This is my favorite. Listening is an act of love, and it's so true. Okay, literally this morning, I'm on Facebook. You know how it pops up? Oh, here's a memory from X number of years ago. This one popped up. Hey, Brad, we thought you'd like this memory of something you did 11 years ago. This is what I posted 11 years ago today. Be so close to those you love that when they weep, you taste salt. That's from the Russian poet Boris Pasternak. All right, so we're going to take a couple minutes and talk about empathy, this concept that, that Sister Runia laid out so beautifully. All right. Fundamental to this is to seek first to be led by revelation and inspiration. Um, I'm going to skip this for time. Here are some crucial understandings about empathy. Empathy does not equal endorsement. To practice empathy is to be vulnerable and often uncomfortable. I can vouch for that. Words rarely make someone feel better. Empathy isn't codependence or taking someone else's problems, but feeling with them. The most powerful words you can say are, me too, and you are not alone. To 
practice empathy, we need to come from a place of humility, not pride. If you're doing the majority of the talking, you're not in empathy. And, um, okay, Brene Brown, raise your hand if you like her stuff, you read it in your books, seen any of her, her videos, just love her stuff, love it. Here's what she said about the empathic path. You don't need first-hand experience of an event to extend empathy. We don't need to have been dumped, fired, or lost a parent or sibling or partner to relate. If you've ever felt grief, disappointment, shame, fear, loneliness, or anger, you're qualified to extend empathy. Anyone in here who hasn't felt any of those things? I know we all have. So we're qualified to do this. Um, so the first attribute is perspective taking. Here's what President Nelson said about it. If someone tries to express their anguish, is it possible for us to listen openly to a shocking experience without going into a state of shock ourselves? Can we listen without interrupting and without making snap judgments that slam the door shut of dialogue? It can remain open with the soothing reassurance that we believe in them and understand their feelings. Adults should not pretend an experience did not happen, happen just because they might wish otherwise. Learn to listen and listen to learn. Attribute number two, learn to be non-judgmental. We've talked about that. Um, I love this quote from Elder Renland, and it's going to harken back to, to something Jeff said a few minutes ago. The Savior's mortal ministry was indeed characterized by love, compassion, and empathy. He did not disdainfully walk the dusty roads of Galilee and Judea, flinching at the sight of sinners. He did not dodge them in abject horror. No, he ate with them. I'm of the opinion from our own life that eating with someone is one of our superpowers. Marjorie and I love to invite people over to eat with us. My grandmother had a saying when she was having a gathering. She used to say, we want your toes under our table. Isn't that cute? <laughs> There's something transformative that happens when people are in our home eating food together. The barriers come down. The love rises. Uh, love the conversation about interfaith dialogue. I got to serve on the Santa Rosa Interfaith Ministerial Association for about five years in California, representing the LDS Church. Two of those years, I was president of the association. And uh, monthly, we would have a luncheon, and those would rotate throughout the different meeting houses of the various denominations. And uh, one of the times it was our turn, I said, I'm going to shake things up a little bit. Instead of meeting at, having the lunch in one of our meeting houses in a sterile cultural hall or primary room, I want you all to come to my home. And we lived on a little farm in the wine country, and we set up tables on our back deck. It's a beautiful, gorgeous day in the shade of the trees. And there are about 40 of us out there eating together. Uh, Catholic priests, uh, Muslim imam, two uh, Jewish rabbis, and then pastors from all of these other denominations. And that single act took our relationship from cordial and nice to a real deep friendship. And these became some of my very closest friends in California. Attributes three and four. To understand another person's feelings and then to communicate your understanding of that person's feelings. I love the experience of Mary when her brother Lazarus died. She was saying, Savior, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. Of course, he came. He knew what was, he was about to do. He knew it. But he didn't rush to do that. Instead, he listened to Mary and Martha. He honored their experience and their grief. 
He sat with them in their grief. He wept with them. It was only after he had done all that that he raised Mary and Martha's brother. Not a great example of empathy from the Savior himself. Attribute five, to be mindful, to pay attention. Um, it's easy when we're hearing somebody telling us something about this situation they're in, this difficulty they're having. It's hard not to start formulating your answers, your solutions while they're still talking. You got to shut that off. You got to be present and pay attention. All right, quick recap the empathy attributes perspective taking, be non judgmental, feel and communicate, and pay attention. Now, here's the part that I'm good at. The empathic misses. Now, I want you to just kind of listen with your minds and your hearts and see if there's something here where you feel like, maybe I could do better at that. And take a mental note or an actual note or a screenshot. An empathic miss is when someone shares something personal and vulnerable and doesn't feel heard, seen, or understood. It's a sinking feeling where they feel exposed and vulnerable and now even more alone. Any of you ever had that experience? I have. You bury your soul, and as soon as you do it, it's like, I, no, nope, wrong person, wrong time. Ugh, feels so vulnerable and awful. Difference between understanding the difference of empathy versus sympathy. Um, you know, it's part of our baptismal covenant as the, is that we will mourn with those that mourn. It's part of our covenant. I love this. As we take others by the hand and let them lean on us and walk with them, we help them stay on the path long enough for the Savior not only to convert them, but also to heal them. So it isn't, we don't do the healing. We walk with them long enough so the Savior can come in and do that. Two minutes, love this video. Hope you like it. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy. Empathy fuels connection. Okay, sympathy it. drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is... Ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. <laughs> I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. 
if I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. I love that. Memorize this phrase, especially you guys, us guys who try to fix everything. I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Uh, Gasp and awe. These are the misses. Defensive mode. Oh, sorry your boss was so mean to you today. Oh, he's an idiot. You should quit. They don't even deserve you there, right? Toxic positivity. Kind of famous for this in the church. Someone passes away. We go to the loved one. They're in a better place. You know the narratives. All the positive narratives. What they need to hear in that moment is either nothing or I'm just, my heart aches with you. What they need most is for you to sit with them and mourn with them. If you think that's bad, this one's one I'm still working on. I'm a natural born storyteller. Somebody tells me something that's like, wow, I got one even better. Uh, Give me the deets. Not helpful. At least. When my brother Dan passed away, um, my mother shared this experience decades later in the waning months of her life when she and I just kind of opened up. It's like, okay, we're pulling back the curtain, man. We're going we're gonna to share everything. And I asked her what it was like when Dan died. She told me the experience of a ward member who came to her to comfort her, learning on, about her son's passing, and said, at least you have six other children. All right, here's a review of the misses. If you want to take a quick screenshot, there they are to help you remember. Um, and empathic examples when people feel heard, seen, understood, and less alone. And this is to kind of summarize what Brene said. Empathy isn't about fixing. It's the brave choice to be with someone in their darkness, not to race to turn on the lights so we feel better. Elder Uchtdorf said, this is the endless compassion that allows us to see others for who they are. It's the, through the lens of pure love. We see immortal beings of infinite potential. Quick story about my another one brother, Scott. Um, Got a call from this, this was many years ago. He and his family lived in South Jordan on a little two acre ranchette, all kind of horse properties in their ward. Gets a call from the stake executive secretary. Yeah, the stake president wants to meet you Tuesday night, seven o'clock. He's going, what can he want me for? I don't even go to church. And yet the spirit was telling him, Scott, he's gonna ask you to be the elders corn president. So he shows up, and the, uh, the president says, Scott, the Lord wants you to serve as the elders quorum president in your ward. And he's like, hmm, I had a feeling that was coming. He said, there's, there's a couple problems, Prez. First of all, I, I don't actually attend church. He goes, yeah, yeah, well, you'll need to start going to church. Oh, well, I smoke. Yeah, you'll need to stop smoking. Well, I don't pay tithing. Well, you, you know, starting today, start paying your tithing. But the Lord needs you because you're going to do things no one else could do in this ward. They're, they had this elders quorum that was just floundering, hardly anyone attended. Scott thought, well, I don't know what to do. I have never been in a leadership role in the church. Don't know how this works. So one Sunday evening, about dusk, he saddles up his horse. And he's just riding the horse down the street. Sees Brother Jones over here. Rides over, hey, Brother Jones, why don't you throw your saddle on your horse? Come ride with me. I'm just... What are you doing? I don't know, just riding through the neighborhood. Just He does it. They add a couple more people. Next Sunday, they add a few more people. And they're just talking. They're just connecting as brothers and friends. And in a short amount of time, Sunday nights were like, <laughs> there's this posse of dudes on horses riding through the neighborhood. You want to talk about ministering. This is where it happened. Happened on a horseback on a Sunday evening in South Jordan, Utah, with a man who didn't know anything about 
being a church leader, but he knew how to love people. And a stake president who saw that and trusted that God was, knew what he was talking about. Um, I think words are our superpower. And, uh, uh, yeah, I think I got time for this. We have a granddaughter who identifies as trans. And her son, her, my son, her dad, told us a few weeks ago that this child of theirs said one day, I don't think God loves me. And of course, I you know, get in defensive mode. Where's that coming from? Is that coming from church? Is that coming from school? Where's that coming from? I said, we don't know. But I realized that I could help change that narrative. And so the next time she was up at our home visiting before she left, I said, took her face in my hands. And I said, do you know how much I love you? Do you know that God loves you and Jesus loves you? And she's like, oh, this is getting kind of weird. And I said, sometimes love's weird. She giggled. And every time I see this grandchild, I remind her that we love her. God loves her. All right, here's the deal. Sister Runya said, in these last days, perhaps our greatest work will be with our loved ones. Good people living in a wicked world. Our hope changes the way they see themselves and who they really are. And through that lens of love, they'll see who they can become. All right. Closing out on a really cool story. Um, Marjorie's dad, this is the Draper Temple after he sealed us. Well, when uh, a few months prior to that, when I asked him for permission to marry his daughter, story for another time, maybe tonight on the Lido deck, um, I just said, you know, I just feel so grateful to have a second chance at love. And Wendy Watson Nelson said, well, this is the gospel of second chances. Said, yes. So on our wedding dinner, the night before we were married, I wanted to share that. I wanted my children to hear that message. So I shared that story. Well, the concluding speaker at the dinner was Marjorie's dad. He got up and said, I need to correct something Brad said. He said that this is a gospel of second chances. No, that's not right. He said this is a gospel of third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances. We need to give ourselves grace, see ourselves as God sees us, and see others as God sees them, especially our children and grandchildren, those very closest to us. I, well, I don't have time, but just here's the stuff I'm inviting you to do, so in case you want to remember. I feel so much love for each of you. Marjorie and I tonight, after the farewell thingy. We're going to hang out on the Lido deck. We want to hear your stories. We want to hear your stories of second and third chances, the things that you've overcome, how you've experienced these things in your life. And we have two very, very special guests with us on this trip, Ben and Bennett and Becky Borden. Will you stand up for a second? The Bordens are some of our very dearest friends and have a very unique story and a very unique journey and are uniquely qualified in the area of LGBTQ issues as it relates to church members and our family members. So any of you who are trying to navigate that with your circle of influence, your children and loved ones, um, the four of us are gonna hang out and we're just gonna be sitting there soaking up the stories and we're gonna marinate in love. So come find us and bear testimony to you that the Savior's love extends to all of us. And that this is his restored gospel. And I promise you that we're led by a living prophet. This I know with all my heart. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. <clears throat> Such a wonderful message. Uh, 
I need to work on that, that's for sure. And I think about accepting the atonement and what Christ did with his sacrifice. It requires a broken heart and a contrite spirit just to accept the atonement. And so it's the same process that we have in order to empathize with those around us. Thanks so much, Brad. All right, we are going to take a five-minute break. Five minutes, stretch your legs, run to the restroom, run back. We're going to finish up with uh, Sister Louder here very shortly, so make it quick.